podcast. Life is a hideous thing. Looking good. ISS orbit is confirmed. Incoming launcher has docked. It is good to have contact again. I guess those rumors of everything going to shit down there were just the news blowing up. Copy station one, looking good. Standard orbit position is set. Wait, Kennedy, one of the sensors is set right. You read that? Copy. No, lost contact with the other stations. All the feeds are down seem to reconnect. We've lost the other system. Can't seem to get a visual. We've got a problem. Copy? All contact locks. Maybe the... What's that? Like a blackout covering Mars. You see that, Kennedy? What's going on? Orbit station 213, Moscow. Come in. Orbit station 138, London. Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Over. Come in. Come in. Oh, greetings. Cyberspace of the dead. Now implementing thought experiment number 31. Survival of the end of the world. I've always been interested in survival. From a young age I was listening to cassettes of Robinson Crusoe, Day of the Triffids and War of the Worlds. Then later in the video era, Dawn of the Dead, where the survivors of the zombie apocalypse hide out in a huge shopping mall, the mind boggled. In the post-apocalyptic world, would you survive? What if tomorrow morning you woke to everyone was gone? Maybe it was an asteroid strike, or a viral pandemic, or perhaps even nuclear war. Whatever the cause, the world as we know it is no more, and in the aftermath, you and any other survivors must start a game. Living in this modern age, the cyberspace of the dead as I like to call it, we've become so disconnected from the basic processes that support us, would we be able to relearn skills and the fundamentals of science to rebuild civilization, grow food, generate power, prepare medicines, or get metal out of rocks. I've no clue. As part of the thought experiment, I'd like to invite Brom, fantasy illustrator living in Seattle, Washington, the hotbed of the end of civilization, better known as Microsoft. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Brom to Life is a Hideous Thing. It's daylight still here, but I've, I've got the window blocked off. Ah. It's just to stop play, because I've got a very... Zombies, bullets. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, SAS. Um, <laughs> no, it's just that I've got a very old house. You get any noise outside, it'll pick up on the mic. Um, Great. So how, how's it going? Uh, are we are we live? Are we going? Yeah, <laughs> I've been recording for like two minutes. It's fine. We've been going. Are we going? Uh, good morning, Dave. It's going good. Um, I think you've been busy or you're, I don't know, you seem to be on the convention run. I've been trying to do less and less shows. The difficulty of being an artist is you have to make a bubble within which to be creative. Um, and part of making that bubble is, is promoting yourself and the business side of it. And uh, going to conventions is all part of that. There are parts of the shows I like. I enjoy getting out of my cave, say, so to speak, and interacting with people. It's, it's nice to know people do actually read and see what you produce. Um, but the downside of it is it's, there's a lot of logistics involved. Uh, so I try, I've been trying to minimize the amount of shows I go to lately. It's funny because now I'm older, I, I don't want to travel as much. Maybe from 21 years old to two years ago, I spent a long time, I don't know, traveling, maybe 30, 40 flights a year. And, you know, transatlantic, mm. they're not just like an hour flight. It it became a big part of my life. I had two passports for many years. And um, 
And then suddenly it hit me that I just didn't want to do it anymore, like traveling. Spending all that time in airports, having your bags checked as if you're some sort of terrorist. I just, I just, <laughs> the appeal just wore off really fast. Um, I just got sick of it. So yeah, I've, I've started to build a life now around a home. So maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm getting older. and It's interesting. I mean, um, I always enjoy being there whenever I get to wherever it is, but the traveling definitely has actually literally really become more difficult. Uh, there was a time when you used to just go check into your flight 15 minutes before the flight left and you hopped on the plane and you had a nice big roomy seat and you had a meal with uh, stainless steel utensils and it was a good meal. Uh, so the whole experience was uh, pleasurable. It was, you know, again, nice, big, comfortable seats and a, and a view. And you now the whole thing's sort of a meat grinder and you just, it's a bit humiliating. You have to strip down pretty much to get through the security these days. Uh, and then it's all cramped. And by the time you get wherever you're going, it's uh, you're in pretty bad shape. Anyway, and not to sound like old man talk, but uh, but yeah, traveling has become rough, and it's taken a little, a bit of the fun out of getting there. You kind of hit the nail on the head, old man. We just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was getting older. That I mean, I my opinion of everything has more or less changed since I was 21. I, I think I was, I, I don't know, I was, I was harder back then on myself. Now I'm just way relaxed, more confident. Which is weird because I've never had much confidence. I don't really care what people think about me anymore. Concentrate on one word, and that's happiness. I don't care about money. I don't care about <laughs> what people think and you know where I'm going. I just think, just if you're happy in yourself, then you kind of won the war uh, with life. Um, I'm very lucky to be healthy all the time. I've never been ill. Never been to hospital. Yeah. Which is a lie. My mum worked in the. the she was a theatre <laughs> nurse when I was young, so yeah. I, went, I went to hospital all the time, but not for any ailment. Right. Um, yeah, and I remember that very distinctly, being around, you know, hospital wards and theatres and all that, but never never for me. So I'm very, very lucky in that respect. I very rarely get ill, too. I must eat a lot of bacteria. <laughs> as, <laughs> a, as a Yorkshire it mite. It is interesting, the point you make about as you get older, um, you're just trying to find happiness. Uh, to me, it's it's I'm, I feel like I'm trying to go back to my roots as a child. As a child... I would get up in the morning and I would follow my muse. If I wanted to draw, I, you know, or write or play with clay, I just followed that path. And you know, in the in my twenties and in my thirties, uh, art, as much as I loved art, often became about making a living. About it became competitive to some degree. It became about promoting. It became a, about a lot of things other than just my creative muse. And now, uh, I've just recently passed 50, it seems like everything I'm trying to do is just to make myself happy when I'm in that spot creating in my studio. Do you listen to music much? I do. I listen to music. I listen to books on tape. I, I really love you know anything with a narrative. Uh, it's interesting when you, when you paint, there's the creative side of it where you're concepting and your, your brain is trying to put together the puzzle, the pieces on, on and making this painting work. When that's going on, I usually need uh, either just ambient music, or something that's not distracting. But once I actually start painting, when it's that process of things just evolving out of the paint, it's almost a subconscious place. And that's a great place then to have books on tape and, and maybe movies going in the background. And it's almost like I'm not completely conscious of what I'm doing. It's more of an action-reaction type of process. I um, mean, an interesting side note on that is I feel it's a little bit uh, of a, a hypnosis type of place you're at because often months later, I'll look at that same painting and I'll look at a spot and I can clearly hear the narrative from the book I was listening to while I was painting that spot. So you know that somewhere in your conscious, subconscious mind, things are going on. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. It's funny because Dave McKean, uh, the artist I interviewed on the last episode, said the same thing. He said he had distinct memory of when he was creating and painting um, about what he was listening to, where he was, what was going on in his life. It must be, uh, I don't know, a weird zone to be in. Um, obviously, I've been through that a lot with music. I sometimes refer to myself as a failed artist. <laughs> and not mu musically, I mean as, as actually a painter. Um, because that's where I initially started out after school. Uh, I went to college and I got trapped in doing graphic design. So I got stuck in graphics and um, 
I just went along with it. It was either that or the army. And yeah. I read that well, you, we... you, you're kind of from an army background with your parents. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm an army brat. Uh, something that really fit well with my personality because they moved every three years. And I think that was you know, so important to just broadening my imagination, just seeing how different, different places were. And I, I really came to, to thrive on that to the point now where every three years I get that itch to, to move and change things. Weird, because I, I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but you were in Germany. Yeah, I, um, you know, the, the early on, first three years of my life, it was in Japan, which you know, just made all these incredible kaleidoscope of images you know, Ultraman and Godzilla, there, there was all these fantastic transforming robots. And this was back in 68, 69, before any of it was imported to the US or uh, possibly the UK. And uh, I think that was, you know, a, a, was a strong inspiration to where my art started going along. But uh, from there, you know, I've uh, been all over the United States, lived in Hawaii for three years. Uh, then I uh, lived in uh, Germany for, for two years. I graduated high school there. But while I was there, it gave me the opportunity to, to go year railing all over Europe. But that was a fantastic, it was 1983, which was a fantastic time to be in Frankfurt, Germany, because we had all the, the punk bands coming through. And, and it was back in the days where, you know, X or, uh, would play and there would only be 50 people there. It was almost like you had the show to yourself. Plus just the whole gothic architecture uh, was all very inspiring to me and it was a great place to be a, a, a brooding moody young man so did you ever come to england i did yes i've been uh, when uh when, when we you're willing we've been there but as an adult i've been there several times yes C crap in it no. <laughs> are you kidding no no you know it's it's an outsider's perspective but to us it's it's that age and that history that is so fascinating i mean even to just standing on subway platforms that have been there for so long and and the the grime on the walls it's I, I find it very inspiring you know I'm at a point now where I'm very happy with my location and my environment but uh, there is something about that frantic nature of a city that pulse and and mixed with that history that uh, is very creatively and conducive so as in the intro I had a bit of a snipe at Seattle um, we don't have to include that in the show. Uh, I was just kind of like, I don't know, I, I, it came to me in the middle of the night. I wasn't sure which direction to take uh, the episode in, and I thought, um, you, you, you were doing artwork for Dungeons and Dragons, and I, uh, the guy who did the intro, Jim, well, does a Dungeons and Dragons style um, podcast. And I used to play Dungeons and Dragons when I was young. Not, I actually never played Dungeons and Dragons particularly. I, I played it everything else uh, lord of the rings star wars all that uh -huh. and I, I used to love it i don't i don't know why i, I guess computers um took over but it's still it's still um very popular it seems and then um i don't know I, I, it came to me in, in the middle of the night like why why don't we do this silly little uh dungeons and dragons thing when i got to get brom to do something and i've got <laughs> i've got no real issue with microsoft and bill gates actually uh, it's just that he's got a lot more money than me, so what? I... <laughs> Which so has everybody else in in that reality. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I always liked Seattle. Um, my first ever Cradle of Filth show was actually in Seattle uh, in 2001. So I do have yeah. a, a bit of a soft spot for that place. We moved here, uh, I guess, about 18 years ago, and I've lived all over the place. And for me, what I like about it, I mean, I I guess it could be similar to to England climate wise, but it's, it, it rains a lot and it's not a, a pouring dripping rain. It's a drizzly rain. And I always tell people it's good, uh, good writing and painting weather because it creates that mood and you don't really want to be outside when it's drizzling. So the atmosphere is very conducive to being creative. Yeah. I mean, I'm from Yorkshire, which is probably very similar to kind of the environment you're talking about. Portland kind of, you know, it's very green and, mm. uh, um, I would say not miserable, but it can it can it can get a little bit depressing. Which in some to some people that's the most creative sort of thought to be in, uh, sort of. But the thing that the Northwest lacks that that I long for is again is that is the 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 historical architecture. The even if it's just a road, a brick road, or an old wall that's crumbling, it, I I find that sort of thing very inspiring. You could go to Detroit. That looks crumbling. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like that as well. You know, the first time I went to New York City and we came in on a, on a train and we came in through all the back tr 
rails and it was all these rusting infrastructures from the 1800s and the 1900s. And I even found that incredibly, you know, it was, it was all rotten rust and going back to organic, but at the same time crumbly decay. I find decay fascinating, um, you know. So that's why I was kind of edging for this um, sort of apocalyptic conversation because I was reading a book called The Knowledge. Uh-huh. And it, it's about what happens if it, it didn't really specify how it happened. It was just it was a group of people left. And do we have the skill sets to get back to where we are now? And it went through the process of how cities would become decayed and, and basically just fall down and rot. You know, concrete's not that good for weathering, I guess. And um, trees would come through motorways and or freeways, as you call them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, that, I found that same thing. I found it fascinating that the world could go back to nature and break down. And I love all that. You know, I like modeling and I like building old destroyed houses and, and, and shit like that. I, I once went on a train journey to Poland, which went through Berlin. And behind all the train stations were all the old war pockmarks that have not uh, been filled in. And for yeah. me, I was like, wow, that is actually history, man. That could have been the Russian army, you know, or whatever. That's, exactly. He blew me away. I was like, holy shit. And this is only like maybe yeah. 10 years ago. And anytime you see uh, uh, documentaries or photographs of Chernobyl, some of the areas where we've had either nuclear radiation issues where it has just sort of decayed and, and this sort of gone back to nature, um, it's fascinating. It would be really incredible to, to speculate or, or to be able to see maybe without not actually participating, but how humanity would rebuild itself if there was a total total breakdown. I mean, obviously, it's a subject that's been covered in lots of fiction. I'm a layperson pretty much on every subject. <laughs> <laughs> so, someone said that I was a bit of a World War II buff. When I d- did the maths on that, I read about 14, 15 books. So if that, if that makes you a specialist in anything uh, by reading 15 books, I, I think the world's pretty clueless on just about every oh, subject matter. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> But n- nowadays, I, I find uh, computer games to be quite on the brink of creating something that's truly fascinating. Like, um, I was looking for a survival game, and I found one where you, you were trapped on a desert island on your own and you had to live. And you, there was no zombies, there was nothing to fight. I mean, there were sharks, maybe, in the water. Yes. But apparently it was one of the most difficult games to play because you just froze to death or starved to death pretty quickly. <laughs> and there was nothing, you know what I mean? It was brutal. It was like... Yes. You know, you, you didn't have a gun or anything. It was just the most basic thing. Um, and I've started watching a few programs on TV. So I wanted a top five, like, what would I want on an island if I wanted to survive? I came up with a machete, a way of lighting fire, a good pair of boots, yeah, a, a, a cooking pot, which would be handy, yeah. and um, a Sega dance mat. Yes, Sega dance mat. <laughs> now, the reason I said that is everybody always laughs at it, but basically the, the survivalist would say a tarpaulin. But um, the dance mat keeps you fit as well. Well, you haven't put any limitations on this, so it seems like you know, like you would want a helicopter or maybe a Walmart. A Walmart would be good. You can... Yeah, a sushi bar. A sushi bar. <laughs> a strip bar. Um... <laughs> I think the one of the the other major things that people seem to miss out was company, a, a companion as such, because yeah. loneliness was one of the first things that would hit you within the first few days. Would be the fact that you had no one to communicate with, or bounce ideas off, or physically help you in any way. It was it was quite difficult, so I think people overlook that companionships almost immediately. So um, I maybe want a friend. You probably eat your friend. Um. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My friend would eat me. Yeah, um. exactly. It's like Robinson Crusoe again. Which, uh, yeah. Have you ever read Robinson Crusoe? Or I have. Yeah. And what was the film with Tom Hanks where he was stranded on the little Ca- island? Castaway. Castaway. Yeah. I, I think that put all that into perspective. But he was on a nice island. It was a, you know, it looked like a kind of a place I wouldn't mind staying. You know, he was in a hurry to get off there. But, but I guess it again comes back to companionship. You know, you want something other than a soccer ball for a friend. Yeah, I think he was there for four years. And in comparison an... to Robinson Crusoe, he was there for 28 years. Yeah. So that's, and he had a friend, he had Friday, who he'd, he couldn't speak that's to. That's right. But, um... Seems like after 28 years, they would learn each other's language, but... Possibly. Um, I watched a survival program the other night. Where it, it it took the guy two weeks to start a fire. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, and wow. I was like, dude, I'd want to do that in the first four hours. It's so easy on film, rubbing the two sticks together. But uh, the reality of that, I I've never done that before. No, and I think he kept getting the wood wrong. Yeah. So I think you obviously don't consider anything of knowledge. You just think you just rub your hands together and fire starts. It's not That's really right. how it works. I don't think. 
Um, I'd be fucking useless. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be more frustrated in the fact that I know le- not enough. I think I'd be more frustrated in myself. And when I changed career recently, I became a chef. Oh, and, you did? Yeah, and I knew nothing about chefing. Nothing. <laughs> well, that's interesting. And how's that going? Yeah, I want to kill myself daily. Um, oh, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> At my age, going into a, a career change of the such drastic proportions was actually yeah. a real challenge. And um, confidence, I think, played a big part in... A lot of people look at people on stage and think, wow, you must be confident. Yeah. The only thing that they keep doing that for is because they're not confident in Uh, changing career. You know, you can't see Lemmy being a chef, I'm sure. Not to pick on Lemmy, but you know what I mean? It's like it took a lot of confidence to actually um, walk away from that. Because life life was easy, like, in some respect. You just had to show up and fucking drink. Were you ever into Star Wars? (laughs) I wasn't that big of a Star Wars guy. when I was in seventh grade when Star Wars came out, and it was such an important year in my life because several other profound influences came along. It was when I bought my first Frazetta books. The, those books came out in 76 or 77. Um, along with that, I, I started uh, reading kind of late in sixth grade. I mean, reading novels, and I, I read my first John Carter Mars novel, and I just became addicted. My my whole room just became full of books. And uh, I read The Lord of the Rings all in a row. And it, it just seemed like The Lord of the Rings took over my life. All my walls were covered with drawings of Lord of the Rings. Um, that combined with the Frazetta stuff. So the Star Wars things came out at the same time. And I, and I really did love it because it was such a... Uh, revolution in science fiction everything went from the future being so clean and crisp to be a a, a more a dirty uh, realistic future in a lot of ways and i definitely spent plenty of time with my friends in the library uh you know drawing our star wars creatures but um the point i was trying to make is i feel that uh i was much more of a lord of the rings fantasy guy when i was when i was younger and, and michael moorcock's another one too that the whole elric series i caught on to that probably about in eighth or ninth grade and uh, read all of those along with the quorum and and uh, it seems like that's what my sketchbooks are most full of yeah i was a huge fan for zeta fan i was very sad to find that he died um quite a while ago actually and, and obviously geiger was a huge influence for me yeah uh, and he passed away this year you know huge influence really I was looking back at some of his artwork from the early 70s and it was mind-blowing, you know, showing phallic symbols and people having <laughs> sex with alien sort of backgrounds. It was like, wow, you know, that, I don't think people really could understand looking at that now. It, it's still inappropriate in some, some you people's know, eyes. The, the 70s were fascinating. The 70s, and I don't mean to romanticize about any particular era. The 70s had so much bad and so much good, but it was probably the most creatively free time in the history of the world. And I mean that both on the liberal side and on the conservative side, meaning it was a time when people could just do their thing without being uh, attacked for it. There there just seemed to be no, all boundaries were being pushed. And that's in art and film and music and humor and comedy. I I mean, I remember as as in second grade, I have, my brother was three years older than me and he collected all these horror magazines. And I've been making a point of tracking them down now that I'm uh, older because they're very nostalgic to me. But the contents to these, and these are eerie publications, not creepy and eerie, but uh, these are like a uh, tome of the vampire. And the content is just mind-bogglingly unpolitically correct. I mean, it just, it would cause such controversy if it's released today. But, you know, there I was a second grader and I had stacks of these in my room. And, uh, you know, I can't say they didn't warp me because I'm... <laughs> I'm not the best uh, person to go by, but but they didn't. They, you know, I I found they inspired me. I I didn't treat them as anything more than what they were. They were comics. Yeah, you, were you into comics at all? Again, I was more into to the horror magazines, the creepies and eeries, and famous monsters from film and uh, a, a bit of comics. Again, in the '70s, the horror comics were really popular. We had Bernie Wrightson and Jeff Jones and and Kaluta and all that crew out there and, and um, my brother collected all the EC comic reprints and again it it seems like my heart always went to the horror stuff I was always drawn into that Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein was one of my favorite graphic novels yeah you know that just that that whole project consumed him but his heart was in that as well and I, the point I was going to make is I, I tended to lean more towards the, the vampires and werewolves than I did the superheroes I can see why because 
in my eyes, <laughs> superheroes don't really do much. Yeah. They're just there as like a crux for everybody's like guilt about destroying the world in the first place, and we need someone to save it quickly <laughs> without any effort of his own. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and I, I guess in a way, I looked at the the monsters as my superheroes. I know that when the neighborhood, when we dressed up and we we played our little games, and you know, one friend was Superman, another friend was Aquaman and you know I always wanted to be Dracula or Frankenstein it was uh, I, I like the idea of the superpower of these monsters I guess the classic monsters it, well yeah the classic and, and um, you know there were just so many strange underground comics uh, were uh, going as well in the 70s and, and there were some amazingly twisted stories there was a, a comic called Slow Death and they commissioned artists like Richard Corbin and their only constraint was it had to have something to do with the, uh, what do you call it, with ecology. Something to do with ecology and the environment. But these guys went crazy. I mean, they went as intense and over the line as an extreme as possible. And then there would be this small environmental connection to pull it together. But uh, those were fairly ghastly in their, their own disturbing way. Because when I was l- doing a bit of research about, you know, <clears throat> there's obviously the classic monsters, you know, Frankenstein, and, uh, with the werewolf, uh, Wolfman or whatever, Dracula and, and Mummy. And then we, we came more into the paranormal, um, which is like Loch Ness Monster and Sasquatch, uh, you know, Bigfoot or whatever. And, and I, I think zombies were in that category. And I think in the mid 70s to early 80s, that explosion of zombie movies the first time round had a big yeah. influence on me. Um, well, basically scared me to death. Uh, yeah. I remember my parents coming home from being out and I wouldn't move. I'd be like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> I think the atmosphere for them has definitely changed now in modern movie where you know they can run suddenly and everybody's got OCD where they can't wait for a zombie to walk over to the other side of the room. It's not scary anymore. But that was the fear yeah. that they never went away. There is a film from 2010 called The Dead. It's set in South Africa. And uh, it's very like that. The zombies are really slow and dumb, but they're always there. You know, you, you, your tire goes down on your car and... There's one just like a minute away, and you've got to do it in a minute. It's, it, the, the fear was way, wow. way better than the modern, Yeah. in my eyes anyway. I'm very retro in the movies thing. I seem to dislike modern film. Yeah, everything has become about spectacle. Um, you know, the effects they can get with um, com- with CG is amazing, but they've become more reliant on that instead of story and suspense. You know, there's always exceptions to that rule, but it just seems over and over... You know, you see a great trailer and you go, this is going to be awesome. And it's basically the trailer. It's just all effects and um, spectacle instead of story and character. I do wonder if that's probably why there's never been a real good Lovecraftian style Cthulhu movie. Because obviously the CGI could do a huge Cthulhu coming out of the sea. Right. And that's what it would all become about. It would be the most be- beautiful, visually stunning thing. But they would lose the, the heart and soul and the, the creepiness of yeah. of at the heart of that. But luckily, we've had a bit of a renaissance in, in the television department uh, with series uh, because they don't have the same budgets necessarily as the movies do, and they've become much more character-driven, you know, and I've been just enjoying the heck out of television for the last three years, whether it's Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. There's just so many I can't even think of them, but uh, I've really been enjoying television of late. Yeah, Dexter was my personal favorite. Yeah, Dexter is good. Um, I think I've watched that series now maybe three times since it came out, and um, I've never watched Game of Thrones yet. Yeah. Everybody um, always says oh, you should watch it. I hated Walking Dead; it was so dumb. <laughs> Walking Dead really frustrated me, and what yeah. frustrated me is the the number one thing is if you're dealing with an element that when it bites you, you become infected. The the your number one imperative would be to cover your flesh, and and nobody seemed to make that a priority. Um, and then, you know, you would always have objects in your hand to defend yourself. And then, you know, just on a character level, it, it appeared to me that there was so much infighting among the characters. And what I've seen among humanity is when you have a common enemy, you tend to bond instead of break apart. And so I found that very frustrating that the characters didn't form tighter bonds, that they were fighting amongst themselves so much. Yeah, I think that was the dra- that's the only drama that they have is that the survivors are so dumb. It's just so frustrating. <laughs> um, that you, you're right. They don't seem to protect themselves very well. Even one of them goes around on a motorbike. It's like, yes. dude, you could get an Umvi. Why would you drive around on a motorbike? <laughs> that's right. But just to go on a technical level, would Kevlar, you know, the, the light, protective, bulletproof armor that you can wear, would that be bite-proof? I think it would be. So why don't <clears> you just dress up in Kevlar? 
and Absolutely. the zombies would eventually lose. <laughs> it's that it, simple. It, it, Kevlar and some football gear, a football helmet, you know, it's just leather boots. They're not this. They're not smart, so they'll just sit there and chew on your your Kevlar, you know. Just dress like a goth. Zombies wouldn't go anywhere near. <laughs> <laughs> Society these days seems to be very. Um, I don't know when we were young. You, you had punks. You had rockers. You know, mods. Everything was really definable. Now it just mm. looks like people have just been shopping at a flea market and dresses. You know, fashion's all mingled up. It's like you can get some guy who likes Bon Jovi and likes. Metallica. It wasn't that definable. You know, we were totally separate when we were younger. I don't know. I don't know if it's it, better or worse. We. It's, it was easier to have revolutions when people dressed more alike. You know, in the '60s and in the '70s and '80s, and and somewhere in the late '80s, anything goes happened, and so it's hard to have another revolution. It's hard to break away when there's nothing to break away from. Chaotic fashion, music. It seems like it's sort of been repeating itself, churning itself together for the last 20 years. I haven't seen anything really fresh and new since 1982, you know, since the the, the, the whole new wave punk broke. You're living in a city where we'll change the world probably for the last time musically with grunge. But I guess the death of Kurt Cobain kind of finished that. So, <laughs> Well, you know, and, and grunge was, again, was sort of a combination of the, the whole punk and and metal sort of coming together and you know it's i still see remnants of all these different genres and subgenres and they just sort of I, the word you used churn is a good word they just sort of churning back and forth but there's no real breakaway like when you know the the mods hit or when the, the rolling you know there there's these punk rock i mean that was like nothing ever before punk rock well that's so shocking um we seem to be moving in little directions here and there so it it's going to be interesting if there can actually be another revolution. What what do they call it now? Hipster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which seemed to be prevalent on the west coast of America, I saw. Yeah, yeah. Everything seems to be getting labeled one way or another. But It, um, it seems like a disease to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that rigid anymore. Like, obviously, I was very defined as a child because I like thrash metal, and not many kids at school like that. So I was definitely yeah. one of, like, five kids in a thousand we were just standing on our own pretty isolated <laughs> it was the same for me i was in in the south of the united states and i was really inspired by the the punk rock music of the mid 70s this is 78 79 80 and uh that was me and maybe again one or two other people that even heard of these bands and so amazing when i finally made it to art school and i started running into other people that appreciated uh, the fashion and the music that, uh, you know, I did. And it created an identity, and I bonded to that. Um, and it has been tough in some ways to see that identity so, what's the word, ha, ha, to have gone in so many directions that I, I no longer identify with it as much, maybe. Yeah, it's undefinable. It's just a yeah. mess. It, it looks like kids have been dressed up in a flea market wearing old clothes yeah. from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And that modern fashion looks like that. It's just, what are you? You're just a mess, <laughs> and not not to be uh, homophobic in any way, but I find men are very effeminate now. Which yeah. and they're not; they're very into girls. I'm not saying they're gay. I'm just saying that they're very e effeminate, you know. And then the they <laughs> kind of touch on that yeah. side, and they're not that ashamed. They, you know, it's it's very open-minded now, and there's no defining yeah. sort of angle that people can go into. It's uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I do know a lot of young people. It's funny. It's um because in a way that's what we were striving for. Not that I ever had a grand cause, but I remember it was important to me that people had the freedom to dress and express themselves as they want. And that has been achieved, I feel. And uh, there's a lot of freedom in that. But what you lose is, in a way, it's it's nice to have something to, to strike out against, something to rebel against. And maybe that's the point I'm trying to make, that if you are free to, to dress and express yourself as you want, uh, it takes a little fun out of it. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the ultimate expression of punk was coined with Malcolm McLaren and the Sex Pistols. And even though that's like a very rigid word now and a, and a definite rigid image, it, back then it was like, oh my God, these are like aliens. You know, they were like so weird and so volatile as people. It was like... They were so shocking. The, the first punk anything I saw was in Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke. And that was 1977, maybe. And I saw it in the movie theater and... 
<laughs> and she, that movie, they went to a punk rock club. I never heard of it. And I just thought they were the scariest, mentally ill looking people, the most repulsive people I ever saw. I was like, why would anybody <laughs> want to make themselves look like that? And two years later, I was doing everything I could to look like those people. It, it's interesting sometimes what shocks and repulses us also attracts us. I think in the 80s, I had to suffer the skinheads. Uh, yeah, they were like a, a, an even more twisted version of a punk, a very defined image and quite volatile. Yeah, the, the, the skinheads in, in England were, were um, very violent, right? They, I mean, they had a, a more gang-oriented agenda. They were politically intelligent too. They weren't just doing it as an image. They, they were against the government, and they were against authority, hated the police. You know, they, they, they were kind of clever people. Yeah. But they were, you know, they were violent. They would sort out a situation that wasn't even a situation. They would deal with it in violence. You know, if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, in a in a nightclub or go to school disco, and ten of them turned up, you, uh, it was a mess. You know, it would they would be vom- yeah. vomiting everywhere and you know attacking the not the kids but the t- teachers. You know, they'd be wow. throwing, throwing bricks through windows and spitting everywhere, and you know, like oh, it was. Um, you basically stayed away from them kind of people as much as you could yeah. because they would be friendly and then they'd turn on you like mad dogs, you know, and you'd be like, right. you, you had no reason why. Uh, it's not a very nice group of people to be around. You, you'd definitely scarper if you saw them coming. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's interesting. In the States, in, when I was in Atlanta in 83, um, a lot of times the kids in the States would see what's going on in Europe and they wouldn't understand it, but they would uh, imitate it. And we had a... a a skinhead gang going with the local music scene and it was interesting because it was a music based skinhead gang they had blacks and whites together and they were in the ska music and they wore their boots and their flight jackets and shaved their heads and it was a i wouldn't say it's a positive group but it was it was about being self-expression and about music and it you know it was sad to later see that become much more political and much more about either white supremacist or, or, you know, very negative political goals. I think that initially why you had a skinhead was because you couldn't have your hair pulled in fighting. Yeah, right. So yeah. it was more about violence than anything else. <laughs> yeah, now it's become much more associated with political agendas, uh, definitely not musical agendas. And and I know that uh, the, few, the handful of skinheads that I knew back in the early 80s, they, they have nothing to do with it anymore because they were about music and not about political issues. But maybe maybe this is where the conversation's going, is that I wanted to chat to you about um, the effect of computer games, and well, computers in general. Um, maybe kids are just... Oh, I, I hate the word kids, but you know, the youth. They're, they're, they're born into the internet now, whereas for us, we've seen it come from nothing. And we were very patient with, like, you know, your first computer game on cassette, and you had to load it up, or maybe even do your own programming. It was kind of marvellous at the time. We're so patient, I have no idea. Um... <sighs> But kids these days seem to have better things to do than go outside and set fire to the neighbor's bonfire. I don't know, you know what I mean? They're not as mischievous as we were. Um, maybe that's a good thing, I don't know. It... I think about that a lot, uh, both in how it applies to my children and how it applies to myself. I, I don't want to sound like the you know, the, the, the older generation always says, my generation was better. But, but there's certain facts that are undeniable, and one of them is the fact that when it was summer and I was out of school, there's a lot of power in getting bored. Being bored is, can be a very good thing in the fact that it makes you find ways to entertain yourself. And if you have a creative mind, you know, it, it leads to a lot of productivity creative-wise. You, you create, whether it's with your art or just amongst your friends with games or, or being innovative, finding ways to, to focus that, those creative energies. And I feel certain with my obsessive personality, if these games had existed, that those long summers where I invented whole worlds would have been spent playing these games. So I, I feel the games would have inspired me in some ways, but I feel that it would have taken away, it, it would have deprived me of the ability to learn how to invent, maybe. It would have limited that. Just going outside and trashing some wood. <laughs> in the backyard yeah. to make a yeah. gun to make a little gun or something you know and in your mind it was the best gun you've ever had I, I thought it was Boba Fett you know for a while uh, <laughs> well I, I mean silly things I remember uh, it was one rainy day uh, and the the gutters were full of water and somebody got out a toothpick and they had a toothpick race and the next thing you know everybody went out and they made better toothpicks and uh, we got a hose out because it stopped raining and but by the end of the week we were building these little ships with sails and it became 
so competitive. The whole neighborhood, there was probably, you know, 20 different kids there. But I don't think that would have ever happened these days because everybody would have just been over each other's house playing, yeah. um, you did, know, the, the games instead. I, did, I didn't know you had kids. Did you let them play out? <laughs> I, I did. Um, I have two boys. They're, they're both in their early 20s now. But, oh, uh, you know, they didn't. They had an unusual upbringing. It, what's, what's funny about them, it, nor, what's normal to people is what they're used to. What they, everybody thinks their own upbringing is normal because that's what they're used to. So their whole life, like when I worked at TSR, all my friends were artists or writers and their houses were all, you know, their, their collections of monsters and art. And they just assumed that's how everybody was, that everybody spoke this language of, of ghouls and goblins and uh, of fantastical monsters. And it has been interesting as they get older and, and they see that, that what they consider their normal is not normal. So they perceive what other people see as normal is, is, um, is a bit strange. Yeah, I've been trying to define the word normal for a long time. I think obviously being in a crazy rock and roll band for a long time, uh, people were... But they would remark the fact that I was quite normal as a person. Yeah. And I thought that was strange because if I acted like a rock and roll star and you know, got drunk and pulled my trousers down and made a fool of myself, that would be completely acceptable. But the, yeah. fact, <laughs> the fact that I was quite normal made them comment on it, which I yeah. thought was a bit a bit scary. Um, I, I don't know whether I liked that because they shouldn't be shocked the fact that someone's normal. They should be shocked the fact that someone's crazy. Um, and so normality swapped over with craziness and craziness became the norm. Uh, yeah. so, you know, and so what is normality? It's difficult to sort of define at that point. Well, people have expectations and it's easy to assume that certain creative personas come with those expectations. Uh, uh, people are often disappointed when they meet me in person that I am you know, not covered in tattoos and uh, seem to be personable for the most part but I think that comes from spending way too much time by myself in a room I'm just very happy to be interacting with human beings at that point yeah I don't have any tattoos either um, and I think it's weird coming out of the, the sort of back you know the work I did for 20 years yeah. and, and actually survive with with no scars my friend said all the scars are in here yeah you know, why yeah. didn't you ever get any tattoos well there were several reasons I was broke and yeah. that's the real sign of a someone in a band is you've got no money. Yeah. And as a bit of an artist myself, I wanted to design my own. Yeah. And I wanted to blow myself away. I wanted to be like Geiger and like Cthulhu <laughs> and like, you know, everything I was into all at the same time. And then as you kind of got busier with your life, you had no time to really sit down and design it. And then when you realized you were 35, you thought, well, what's the point anyway? I mean, England's not really a climate where you can walk around with your top off. Unless of course, yeah, you, that's true. Unless of course you're a poser. <laughs> that's that's funny. It's very similar to me as well. I kept trying to come up with that perfect tattoo, and what was interesting is how that perfect tattoo changed every five years. And now I'm so glad I didn't get that one or that one. And and then I at some point I realized, geez, what I like changes so much. I don't want something permanent on me that I can't alter later because my taste changes all the time. Yeah, I think there's only been one definable thing I've been into since I was a kid, and that's like werewolves. <laughs> and I could have a really awesome werewolf tattoo. And then you think, well, you know, I'm now 75, and I've got a fucking <laughs> werewolf on my arm. <laughs> yeah. You know, what am I trying to say to people? And like uh, I say, England's not really the climate to be walking around with your top off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like uh, you'd have to sort of go out of your way to show this artwork off. And I've, I've become quite introvert. In, in as much as like I don't really want people to be in a pub bar and come over and like oh man you're still with the band and all that shit you know it's right. like you're attracting your own attention so I've become quite normal looking I've still got long hair and this is the first beard I've ever grown which seems to pick up a lot of attention uh, the beard yeah, yeah. I'd, I've had 44 years of no beard and then four months with and, and what kind of attention good or bad well it seems to be quite good I mean a lot of people say oh you look oh, a lot better and it's like, well, thanks. <laughs> 40 years, I must look shit then, I don't know. <laughs> the weird thing is, Brom, is it took no effort whatsoever because hair doesn't, you know, like, it doesn't painfully grow out of your skin. It just, it just <laughs> you just ignore it and it's there. And it's, yeah. you know, when people say, I've got a great beard, mine's better than yours, you're thinking, well, t what does that mean? It's like, you don't yeah. rub a certain amount of shit on your face and it grows. <laughs> it just, it just comes out, you know, and some people don't do it. And I don't know, it, it's like tattoos. The only two people that are ever having a conversation about tattoos is people with them. 
uh, apart, yeah. from, apart from us, of course, to have I mean, a lot of yeah. tattoos for people to then say, oh, that's cool, man. And then, you, you know, if you don't have any tattoos, you're listening to two people talking about drawing on their own arms. It's like, yeah. eh, a bit weird. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not in, in this conversation. <laughs> so you, were you ever, I mean, I know you did the cover for Diablo 2, which kind of led me into thinking that you might have been into computer games. Uh, are you into computer gaming? Um, I, w- I was a, quite a bit when I, I got my first PC, late 90s, 96, 97, um, sometime around when Doom 2 came out. And at first I was completely addicted to them in Diablo, Diablo 2, and they became repetitive to me. I just felt to some degree I was just playing the same game over and over with better graphics. And it just, uh, and plus it became more and more difficult to find time to play them. Art and families just sort of took over. I think as I get older, my patience with them is definitely declining. Yeah. Because they're aimed at, I guess, young people. You know, where you can learn 15 different moves on the controller. And when you've done that, it's sort of embedded in your mind, so you can do it, like, in your sleep. But then when you do that again on another game, it's all scrambled. I just find myself, like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I can't even jump jump anywhere or, like... And I just... My patience with them is just virtually gone. Um... I've just got a PS4 and it's a beautiful machine. We could have only dreamt yeah. of that in the early 80s when I got my first Atari, um, which was made of wood, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. It did have a wood panel on it. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Did you ever hear about War of the Worlds? It's a soundtrack um, sort of story you were listening to. Um, you said you, li- you, you like listening to sort of audiobooks, but War of the Worlds by Jeff Wayne. I'm not familiar with. I mean, I'm familiar with the original one, of course, but uh, I'm I'm not. Because this Sad. came out in 1979. Um, it was just it wasn't um, a visual thing. It was a book uh, with beautiful paintings in it about War of the Worlds. And was it had sort of a World War One look to them? The pictures. It's Victorian, yeah. It's like Victorian style. Oh, okay. I I think I might have seen that. It was Richard Burton that was uh, the main character. Ah. And um, I've I've sort of the intro was a bit of a rip off of the ending of that where there's the astronauts and they get cut off and then you don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah. I, just, I just basically ripped off that whole thing. <laughs> I, I remember listening to that as a kid and I was I was uh, yeah it was pretty scary. My dad used to play it when he was drunk and um, it used to scare the scare scare to death. Yeah. Um, and that sort of opened my mind quite big. It became a big influence, especially with the metal bands I was involved with. You know, a lot of people say, I get you into Metallica and all that. And you're thinking, well, not really. We just want to be a, a louder version of War of the Worlds. <laughs> yeah. You know, wow. very epic and, and all that. But um, It's the... interesting, again, how so much of what we're trying to do creatively reflects back to our youth. It reflects back to impressions of our youth. Um, and, I mean, as you're saying, this, these things that scared you, you're, you're trying to find ways to reproduce them with your art and with your music. And uh, as I was talking about earlier as well, there's... You know, that feeling when I was a kid, when I was, would just sit down and I would write a story and draw the pictures and then staple it together. I feel that now that's what I'm trying to recreate as an adult. I, you know, I write my books and I, I paint and illustrate the characters and I just put it all together on the computer now instead of using a stapler. But, but still, it, it is in so many ways trying to recapture those impressions and feelings um, from from childhood, which are always so intense and so deep within us. Yeah, it's difficult to try and remember a lot of it. And I've found, now I'm older, I'll be walking down the street, I'll smell something that reminds me of when I was maybe, maybe so, I was so young, I was maybe in a pram. Yeah. Uh, Do you call that in America, what do you call a pram? Uh, A a carriage, a buggy? Baby buggy, yeah. So this is like quite a distinctive memory coming right back from when I was maybe in, uh, you know, like so small, like four, five years old. You mm-hmm. know, you'd be going down the street in your little buggy, and it'd be raining and quite dark, and everything would be really dis- sort of um, stark and distinct smells and certain lights on the road because you were a lot closer to the ground back then, so you yeah. seem to notice everything <laughs> in a different angle. And yeah. um, I seem to be getting a lot more memories now. I'm older about like that, like triggered memories, and it, it's kind yeah. of it's not scary. But it is because you're still the same person. You're just a lot. It's just a lot further down the line, and you yeah. just think, "Wow, that connection is literally like two seconds." But it's 40 years ago. <laughs> exactly. Uh, time is so thin at times. It's very strange. You wonder sometimes uh, the old people how they f- fucking deal with it. Like the 96. How the hell do they deal with that shit? I don't know whether I'm going to be good at that. I don't know. 
<laughs> well, it's it's interesting that the, the those memories impressions when you're young stay with you stronger than the ones that you you know have when you're older. They just somehow they they imprint on you deeper. It's like they're in the very bottom of your hard drive and not in the the top where they're getting erased and re erased over and over. Didn't drink alcohol back then. Yeah. <laughs> Which I seem to think that a lot a big chunk of my say mid twenties to forty when I was the rock and roll star um, has been deleted by alcohol. Um, it's, uh, pro- it's probably in there repressed memory. Um, I'm sure if I'm drowning one day it'll all come back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm surely going to remember some horrible shit. <laughs> well, Things. plus you didn't have social media back then where everybody was recording everything. You know you could. Uh, these days, your life would have, you know, a hundred different people would have shot a video or took a picture and uh, it would have all been documented somewhere or another. So there's pros and cons to that, I guess. I guess people don't keep diaries as much as they used to. I used to keep a diary every other year because it was very um, sort of intense and I couldn't be bothered every yeah. year. So I'd do it every other year. And um, nowadays, I guess people will do it on Facebook. It kind of logs all that. So you could be born. And yeah. then you just, all your life's just like spewed out over the internet. <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm kind of glad mine's not. I always said that the only person that doesn't have a picture of when they're a teenager is anybody that's 20 and above. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants them teen pictures on the internet. <laughs> well, I'm just, you know, things were so black and white to me when I was in my early 20s. And the way people go on rants on social media these days, I, I'm just so very glad that... Uh, you know, some of the issues I felt strongly about then are not are not documented because uh, because I see things a lot differently now. Things in shades of gray instead of black and white. I learned a, a lesson one day. I think this was back in the MySpace days. So it's like 2005. Right. You've been out drinking. You come home and you've got a problem with something and you just go yep. on the Internet and you sprawl it all out. And then next morning you think, oh, my God. Yeah. So uh, there should be a drunk like a uh, button on the internet where you uh, there press be. it and it just that's, cuts you off. <laughs> well, well, people seem to be so sensitive these days. Everything, it's like everybody is looking for something to be offended by. So, you know, it, it's almost to the point where I don't feel comfortable expressing my true thoughts because I feel they're going to be misinterpreted. It's, it's, so in a way, it's put a damper on social media. I, there's parts of social media I really enjoy is it being an introverted artist who's fairly isolated, it's really nice to be in touch with other artists and see what they're doing and what's going on. But I do feel that to some degree the, the, the media has been hijacked by you know this new wave of social justice warriors who are just so quick to call people out over the most you know, nonsensical things because it somehow affects their agenda one way or the other. Uh, it takes some of the fun out of it, I guess. Yeah, I don't think it transposes humor very well irony it doesn't sarcasm. or sarcasm yeah no. sarcasm especially and 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 i can be a very sarcastic twit when i want to be and uh and i've just learned that i, I can't because nobody or i shouldn't say nobody there is a, a percentage of people that will will never get it and they will always uh be turn it in yeah be offended find a way to be offended i, I do realize that arguing on the internet and sex <laughs> is two very easy easy things for the internet to decipher <laughs> you know, it's it's good for people talking about sex because it's just you just write whatever you think and they're arguing. But anything sort of subtle like humor and anything like you know you're trying to be nice to people and someone will sort of interject with like oh you're just being uh, weird or yeah you're drunk or whatever. You know, it's yeah, like they don't yeah. get it at all. And so I'm always I always I only post things that are cynical and maybe even negative. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I know them emotions are going to cut through straight away. Whereas if I'm being yeah. nice, people are like, "What have you? Have you fucking anyone drugs, man? Yeah, <laughs> this is not, not you. Th- have you been hacked?" <laughs> but do you, I don't. I, I'm sure you don't partake in Facebook as much as maybe. You, you know, it's it, again, it's something that's a love-hate relationship. It's become a reality of being uh, an illustrator these days. You 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 have to do it for business reasons, and I don't mind that. I I, I like having a place to display my work and, and to talk to people about things I'm I'm doing. Uh, but sometimes it does feel like it's uh, become another part of the business that used to I would write and I would paint and it was all handed off and somebody else took care of all the promotions and whatnot. And now you, if you want people to know about a project that you're doing, you have to spend a lot of time promoting it. And at the end of the day, I just want to be in my room drawing and painting. So anything outside of that always just feels like a bit of a distraction. But 
I will still stand by the fact that I, I do enjoy the interaction with other artists and the fans to just see what's, you know, it, it, I think I would really be, have no clue what was going on in the world if I didn't pay attention <laughs> to some degree. I, I, I could only imagine, you know, the things that would be going on uh, outside my world. And, and it's fascinating to think, too, it was just 10 years ago, 15 years ago that our only source of news was the news here in the States. It was... You mind, can you imagine being trapped on a desert island, how beautiful it would be? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to read anybody's fucking Facebook shite for a start. <laughs> and then there's that. It would be nice to be able to turn off, um, you know, every whining person with a with an agenda. Absolutely. Pets seem to have a definite hierarchy on the internet, I've noticed. And, um, oh, pets? <laughs> Well, I can't particularly pick on cats because dogs get it as well, just as equal. You know, anything cute. Um, yes, absolutely. Is massively popular, but I'd love it if these animals could talk for maybe one minute and basically say, you know what, I never signed off on any of this shit. Get get all that crap <laughs> off there, man. That's that me taking a shit on the back of it, and you put it on the internet is funny for you guys, and you dress me up as a little fucking in a dress or whatever, dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd yeah. love it if animals could speak for a moment and just be like, oh. What are you doing? <laughs> it's funny. I can post a painting and, you know, get a couple hundred hits and oh. post a, one cute uh, critter in my yard and I can get several thousand hits. So people love the critters. Do you think that is Facebook, though? Because I posted a link about my podcast and I got like six likes, literally six. And then the next day I, I was hacked and someone said, oh, no, yeah, it's something rude. And that got like 150 likes. <laughs> yeah, so either I need to dumb down a little bit or the internet is not giving out the message. Because I've written to a few friends, say, for example, in America, saying, have you, have you, because, you know, you're kind of my target audience. You like reading, you like movies and all yeah. that. Have you, have you, have you seen my link? And they were like, no. I was like, ah, so it's not, I guess I maybe have to attach a picture of a cat or a kitten or something to it. Is. The, it's to very this frustrating because used to you would post something and it would hit everybody in your list and, and then Facebook changed all that. Um, and it's become very difficult to hit, you know, the people that even do want to see, see what you're putting out there. Yeah. They say it's a, an algorithm, which exactly. Yeah. I've not been to math class since 1986, so I don't know what that means, but, um, I guess it's some sort of computer system that weeds out like uh, clever shit. <laughs> it, it, it basically means instead of it going to all the people that have subscribed to your feed and them wanting to see it, it just goes to a small handful and based on something completely irrelevant. Un understandable. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. And um, I mean, like you say, I go through this cycle of promoting like I'll do a week of research and reading and try and be, you know, like get my shit together and write what I'm doing. And then I'll spend a week trying to get the guest to, you know, to connect because that's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to get people to respond. Um, and I've got a long list of people I've written to and about this, yeah. this much that I have. And thankfully you were very responsive to that. Um, it seems like the artist people are very responsive and open-minded after the podcast is published. I'll spend maybe two or three days, promoting it on the internet trying to get people and I hate that it's like it's like social begging you know what I mean I don't, yeah. I don't like it it's like please I don't want it to be popular but do you even know it's there <laughs> yeah I don't think you do I mean that's the point I was making you know as, as artists we want to create and uh, part of of the business is promoting and uh, used to it was in somebody else's hands and now it's part of our business and trying to find ways to do that that's interesting and engaging to ourselves is, you know, becoming, I think, more and more challenging. Yeah, your wife's an artist too, right? She is, yeah. We um, we actually met at a art camp when we were, when I was 17 and she was 18. And it was a two-week camp. And after it was over and her parents came to pick me up, um, I told them that uh, I planned to marry her. They laughed at me and I went away to Germany for two years and she went to art school in New York City and uh, when I came back from Germany, I married her. <laughs> wow, a man of your words. We, we, we wrote uh, back in those days actual letters back and forth the whole time. But anyway, we were both artists and uh, she spent about uh, the last 16 years, you know, just raising the kids, getting the kids grown and she put her art on aside just to focus on the kids. And then she came back to her art. It's been really interesting, I think, uh, to see how 
she somehow got better as an artist, even though she wasn't painting during that time. In other words, her, her mind grew creatively because when she got back to painting, she quickly was painting much better than she was, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but she does imaginative realism and we have a studio. We're just, uh, right next to each other. Uh, it's nice. It's nice having somebody that's creative and, and is also a painter to, to, you know, run ideas back and forth between and get an opinion and, Sometimes the opinion you do or don't want. But, uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> that's always the ones. <laughs> yeah. I've seen the paintings. They're, they're like photographic, real portraits, and yeah, that you know, it has her hand to them, and and they all have a little bit of a, a a sinister edge to them, and she comes out of that sort of goth punk background as well. So she always is is drawn towards the dramatic and and the dark to some degree. They're very good. Oh, well, thank you, Al. I always found my ju- personal judge of an artist was someone who could do something like that was believable, but not photographic. It was art, yeah. you know. And um, when obviously that's the art is in the uh, eye of the beholder, just like a lot of things. But you know what I mean? It, I, it was it was kind of contradictory to me when I got my first computer and I didn't paint for maybe five years, and then when no. I came back to it, I'd suddenly seem to have lost the skill. Yeah. And it it didn't. Your wife's not seemed to have suffered that. Um, you know, I seem to lose the skill every time I start a painting. I swear I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> I mix up the paint and it's just like, ah, and I just dive in and it slowly comes back to me. But uh, you no, know, she just, she not only just picked it back up, but I, it just seemed, I could see her growing so much from painting to painting to painting. And, you know, I, I have to say, I'm just really, you know, proud of her to see her have the fact that she prioritized her children and then, you know, is now lucky to have this chance to have a, a career in art after all because I know that it was a tough decision for her as, as all artists we have things in us we need to express and it's part of who we are and what we are and uh, and, and and that was missing in her and, and she seems a much more whole person now that she's painting again. Yeah I think, I think I've got songs in my head from 25 years ago that I've never recorded and they're, they're still there. Yeah. It, it kind of fucking sucks. I, I just want to get rid of them. It's like, oh, uh, they're like ghosts, you know, just like bugging you all the time. Yeah. And that's the good way sometimes when you were, say, starting a new um, project musically, you could dump all your ideas on demos and then just forget about them and you'd have an empty brain like a defrag and right. um, start again. But these songs are always with you and I guess I'd like to mm. think that I could maybe go back to, to illustrating and painting, but it's I don't know, I'm very, I don't know, you're probably the same. When you start out, you don't know what you're doing, and it's pencil, and you just think, this sucks, and then someone's going to come yeah. in and go, oh, what's that? And you're like, oh, dude, no. It's just the same as recording, though, when someone hears your demo, and you think, that's not finished yet. You have to point it out to them. And, right. then, they, and then they think, oh, that's, that was the good bit, you know. They don't have a clue. So I don't yeah. know why we're so self-critical. Like, it's <laughs> it's very well, difficult. You know, with, with me, with the painting, it's I'm never going to achieve satisfaction through my art because there's a vision in my head and it's so clear and I start to paint and, it, and you know, there's that optimism that this is going to achieve what that vision is in your head and it never does. So I'm always disappointed when I'm done with the painting. I think I do tend to enjoy my art after I've put it away and I come back to it six months later and, and that original vision has sort of disappeared and, and I can look at it for what it is, not for what I wanted it to be. But yeah, that, that elusive, perfect painting is, is just that. It's always elusive. It's the same as the um, when you write a, net, a record. Someone will listen to it and they say, you know, is, is this it? Is this the best thing you've ever done? You think, well, no, and the next one is because we've already the started. Yeah, we've already started writing that in your mind, you know, and you, you've got yeah. all these ideas all piled up already. I guess in the cycle of music like that, it's a year. You, you may be a year and a half behind, and I think in movies it's probably like five, four, five years behind, you know, from the initial idea that a writer has. To see well, it on noticed, film. It, well, even with novels, writing these novels, I've noticed that because the, by the time I think of an idea I'm excited about, and by the time that novel's done, that's three years later. Um, and that's been a bit of a struggle because with painting, at least, you know, if you get excited about a painting, you can have that painting done in two weeks later and be on to the, the next one. So I can only imagine, you know, with, with the movies and, and with music as well, how a delay between what's in your head and what you're wanting to produce and actually being able to produce it. When I was coming close to ending my career, there's a certain thing in your mind where you have little tick boxes and you want to achieve them before you give up. And I think one of them was to become like a 12-inch doll, like a G.I. Joe, right? (laughs) (laughs) Because it's so ironic that you're actually a 
a fucking like superhero or some something like that. And mm-hmm. I, I said to the guys like, you know, we should we should get like five definable characters and and try and market them as as dolls, oh, yeah. so that I can then retire and get out of this. I wouldn't say retire, <laughs> but get out yeah. of this. And I said, um, I want Brom to uh, do the uh, initial drawings for <laughs> us. <laughs> And they all went, oh man, that's a great idea. But if that means we've all got to quit after they come out, we we don't want to do it. It's like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's I, funny. So it never happened. But you were, uh, well, for me, you were right. The the the, the sort of vision I had as a a, a, tw- a twelve inch doll. <laughs> that would have been fun. <laughs> I, know, um, I know, but it never went any further than that. I'd be like, dude, I'm gonna be designed by Brom. It would have been fucking awesome. <laughs> I'd have looked so cool, surely. <laughs> uh, so well, thank you, Brom. Um, I was glad you could make it. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me. With the illness and everything. <laughs> God, boy, it's just the worst timing. I mean, my brain's still a little bit foggy, which is unfortunate. But um, anyway, it's glad we could get it done in time. Cool. Thank you very much for your time, mate.